Welcome to episode 102 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent writing crime fiction inspired by true crime FBI cases. Today, we get to speak to retired agent Judy Tyler, who served 31 years with the FBI. In this episode, Judy reviews her investigation of the Maurice Lewis, a.k.a. Mo Black, 8th and Allegheny cocaine criminal enterprise, and the surprising spinoff case involving the theft of Philadelphia's historically significant architectural treasures. This spinoff case resulted in the conviction of Charles Cass, a former IRS and Labor Department federal agent. Now, Judy Tyler has extensive experience in the investigation of violent drug trafficking organizations and advanced investigative techniques. She specialized in the recruitment, development, and operation of human intelligence, also known as informants and cooperating witnesses. During her FBI career, Judy received awards from the Mid-Atlantic Region of the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force, OSADEF, and from the United States Attorney's Office, Eastern District of Pennsylvania. Post-retirement, Judy continues to share her experience and expertise as a contract instructor training current FBI agents as part of a specialized in-service program. As you might recall, Judy was one of the first agents who agreed to be interviewed on this podcast. In episode three, she was interviewed about two other drug investigations and her FBI career. Judy and I have been great friends for a long time, and I'm glad to have her back on the show. Now, before we get to that interview, I have a very, very important announcement that I must say, and that is... Go Eagles! If you haven't heard already, the Philadelphia Eagles won the Super Bowl. On the day this episode comes out, I will be down at the parade cheering our team on. I have another exciting announcement. Not as exciting as the Eagles winning the Super Bowl, but it's up there. I will be part of a true crime podcast meetup in Washington, D.C. on March 18th from 2 to 5. The meetup will be at Busboys and Poets located at 1025 Fifth Street, Northwest Washington, D.C. That's on 5th and K. I'll be joining Esther from Once Upon a Crime podcast, Deanna from Twisted Philly podcast, and Haley from Murder Road Trip Podcast. I would love to meet you in person, so I hope you can attend. Information about this podcast meetup can be found on my Facebook page, Jerry Williams Author, and on my website, jerrywilliams.com, underneath the News and Events tab. If you are planning to attend, please let me know by emailing me, tweeting me, or Facebook. Two last things I want to remind you, and that is, one, the open invitation for you to join my reader team. Just once a month, I send out a digest of the podcast episodes, my crime fiction recommendations, and I keep you up to date on entertainment news about the FBI and books, TV, and movies, and what I'm up to. To sign up for my reader team, All you need to do is to go to my website, Jerry, J-E-R-R-I, Williams.com, and sign up when you see the pop-up, or go to my Facebook author page, Jerry Williams Author, and you'll see the sign-up button there. And my last note, don't forget to subscribe to FBI Retired Case File Review on Apple Podcasts, or follow the show on Spotify and other popular podcast apps. All right, I'm done for now. Here's the show. I am excited to introduce my guest today, my good friend, Judy Tyler. Hi, Judy. Hi, Jerry. Well, I'm glad to have you back on the show. I want to thank you for being one of the first retired agents to 
come on the show and get this podcast started. Well, I've really enjoyed listening to all of your interviews. It's made me realize how very different everybody's career is in the FBI. Yeah, that's the truth, isn't it? I've learned so many things about violations that I wasn't aware of when I was working. It's an educational and entertaining venture for me, too. So today, we have a really interesting case because you've worked drug investigations all of your career, but this case kind of morphed into a property crime case. It's a matter of just luck, I guess, that you learned about this. So take us from the very beginning. Tell us a little bit about what you were investigating before you learned about this interesting property crimes case. Okay, the initial focus of the investigation was a drug organization at 8th and Allegheny, the 3100 block of Allegheny Avenue. And it had been in existence for over 10 years in the one in that block of 8th Street where it was an open air drug market. A car could drive up and buy a $10 hit of cocaine and it was routine business for that particular block. It came to light during an interview of someone that had been arrested and a thorough debriefing identified that as one of the biggest drug problems in that part of town and Maurice Lewis was the head of it. This particular drug operation had been going on, like I said, for at least 10 years, and Maurice was known as Mo Black. He was a music promoter, and he invested his drug proceeds in a variety of businesses, a car wash detail place, and properties to rehab. So he was a businessman, and he was not the guy you would ever see out on the street selling the drug. So initially... I went to the police department and had an analyst run for me all drug arrests that took place within a couple of blocks of what I call Ground Zero, 8th and Allegheny, which they named the ball. They called that, let's go down to the ball. That was 8th and Allegheny where all the drug stuff was taking place. This investigation started in the mid-1990s. It was when people didn't have cell phones, we were still using beepers and pay phones. However, Maurice had a cell phone, and so did the top echelon part of the drug organization, but everybody else had to use a public pay phone. And the pay phone was located right on 8th Street at Allegheny, and it was treated as a personal phone in your living room. If a citizen who wasn't part of a drug case tried to use the phone, they'd be given a hard time because they like to keep that phone open for their drug business. And if there's one thing I've learned in every drug case is you have to identify their communication means and network and the words they use. Each operation usually has unique language to identify quantities of drugs. And anytime I debrief an informant or a witness, that's one of the questions I always ask. What do they call a kilo? What do they call an ounce? And in this particular case, a kilogram of cocaine was called a bitch. How many of them bitches I got left would be a common thing you would hear on a uh, telephone. The way Maurice worked it is he had a kilo of cocaine at that time was selling for about $22,000. And they'd be broken down into what they called packs. And the G-Pack was $1,000 worth of drugs in $10 little baggies for sale on the street. And he was a little obsessive about wanting to know how many, how much drugs he had available for sale on the street and how much cash he had as the drugs were sold. So, for example, if a kilo was available for sale in the $10 increment, his pager, and that's how he kept track of it, was 22, that would be $22,000 worth of cocaine available for sale. And as each $1,000 increment was sold, he would get paid 21, 20, 19. So he knew how much cash he had to work with and how much drugs he had available. And as the numbers would decrease, he would have to re-up or have more drugs brought down to the street for sale. 
that logistics take communication with all the members of the organization. So this organization had 19 people who were ultimately indicted, and each person had a unique role in it. So I'll describe for you what the actual tasks were that people had to do. We had paid lookout who would yell, Frankie on the A. That meant police were coming on Allegheny or Frankie on the 8 or the ball meant the police were coming down 8th Street. And it was an announcement to everybody so that drug activity would cease while the police were in the area. I later found out that the reason they came up with that code was years ago there was a old police officer named Frankie who used to patrol that area, and so they just adopted that for their warning. But it took me quite a while to figure that one out. <laughs> As I said, the $10 bags were sold in the middle of the block, and uh, one of the things that I wanted to do to establish the ongoing drug activities was to have some drug buys made right on the block and see who sold it to us. We developed a cooperating witness who had been shot in the arm, and he agreed to go down and buy some cocaine. And so we put a reporting device in his arm sling that was all bandaged up, and we were all set for the buy to take place and brought him down, dropped him off so he could walk up. And now we wanted to see who he talked to, who talked on the phone, and uh, everyone involved. So we had a surveillance van go down and park in the block, and the driver walked away. And we had two agents in the back of the van to photograph the by and observe everything that took place. So the witness went down and was told that they were out at the moment, and he'd have to come back in about an hour. We then saw the person he talked to go to the pay phone, make phone calls, our witness left, and during that interim, somebody became suspicious of the van with the agents in the back, and the drug guys walked over, surrounded the van, and started rocking it and singing that song, What You Gonna Do, Bad Boys, When They Come For You? And uh, so we had to have the driver go get that van out of there. It was too close of an area to make any kind of surveillance. So that's a setback. But in the long run, it helped to our benefit to show that we had tried surveillance and failed. When you do a wiretap at a federal case, you have to show that you have tried every investigative technique before you resort to something as invasive as a wiretap. And making buys, doing surveillance, those are all techniques that we would use in a drug case. And the fact that we could not surveil the area would show the need for having to listen to the phone conversations. The phone conversations that are recorded are always going to be your best evidence because it's direct from the defendant's mouth with no filter. You're kind of a fly on the wall. In this case, we also had a camera so we could watch remotely what was going on on the block. And we could see who was on the phone, but we I still didn't know who all the people were. When I did the initial debrief, I was told we had Mo, Herb, Tree, Chino, Fuji, Wee Wee, Ubi. Well, who are these people really? I had to find out what their true names were. When you say you had a camera, I, I take it it was somewhere high, like on top of one of the row houses, or maybe on a telephone pole or something where or no biz, one would... Or a business. It could have been, yeah, it was within the block. Not far, it was far enough away, but close enough that we could see everything. And eventually they found our camera. And what happened is somebody bought a new camera with a long lens and they were just testing it out on their porch, one of the drug guys. And so he's zooming in on everything he can find and he finds our camera. Hey, there's a camera there. So they send a guy up to go check it out, and he stole our camera. And you see, as we're monitoring, you see the hand go in front of it, and it goes back and forth and into just fuzz. And I got the call. Our camera just got stolen. So did you ever get it back? Yes, we did. We were able to get our camera back. 
I know that that's very important in the Philadelphia office because I had a uh, transmitter stolen once. You know, they took it off uh, of one of my uh, my witnesses, and the ASAC, the assistant special agent in charge, told me you got to go get that equipment. So. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's expensive equipment, and you don't want it out there because, first off, it has your evidence on it, and you need that. But we were able to get our camera back through an informant who basically sold it that you're going to bring a lot of heat down on this in this area if they don't get it back, and somebody turned it in anonymously. So we did get our camera back. But the funny thing was, they opened it up, and there's no film. They're thinking it's a VCR. And we, at the time, were digital, and there's like, there's no film in here. So they didn't think there was any evidence in it. Little did they know. Yeah, and it was just a freak thing that their zooming lens found it. It was like, ah. So these type of setbacks happen in cases, and uh, you just have to roll with the punches. But uh, eventually, we made a successful number of five, and we were able to show that their their phones were used, especially the pay phone, to contact the drug supplier to re-up, and, uh, and Maurice had a cell phone at the time, and we were monitoring what numbers his phone called, and he called the, called the pay phone frequently and would talk to the workers. So I had a lot of great videotape up until the point that the camera was stolen. And uh, eventually, in January, I think it was, of 1998, we went live on the phone for four to five months and started intercepting uh, real-time all of the calls about the uh, drug sales down on the block. And... You get a real feel for somebody when you listen to their phone calls, and they basically live on the phone when they're conducting that kind of business. You get a feel for their personality as you uh, monitor their calls. Around, I want to say, late June, very early July of 98, Philadelphia police picked up one of the, what I call the lieutenants in the uh, organization. And he would be the overseer of the block. And he would be the one that people would come to for issues or problems. And then he would report to Maurice uh, what the problems were. And the drug organization was broken down to uh, with lookouts, paid shift workers that sold the drugs. So they had two shifts, 10 to 6 and 6 to 2 a.m. in the morning. So... It sold from 10 a.m. to 2 a.m. in the morning, round the clock practically. They had to sleep at some point. But they also had a paymaster who handled pay on Sundays, and it was many people that a lunch truck made it part of his stop to stop when they all got paid on Sundays because he made a lot of money. They'd all go buy something to eat. How many people would you uh, say? Nineteen. We had 19 that we indicted, but there were others that came and went. As Sometimes the salesperson would get locked up, and they'd replace them with someone else. And there was also an enforcer who was armed on the block to keep order during all of the shifts and to make sure that they didn't get robbed because there's a lot of cash there as well as the drugs. And drug dealers tend to target each other if they think they can get money or drugs from them. So it was a pretty well-run organization as far as that goes, and they'd have to report for their shift, and there was a couple that lived on the block, an older couple, who agreed to allow their house to be used as a stash house. They would house the kilos of cocaine, because we found the wrappers, the duct tape with all the powder on it, and the records. They kept meticulous drug records of who worked what shift, how much they earned every shift. If they were short, they'd get docked pay, and it would have the days of the week, you know, Monday through Sunday, and then the names of all the workers in a graph form, and they'd have entries, and then at the end, they'd have how much each person got paid, and they would keep this notebook in this house, 
and that on the block so that all those they knew how much each worker would get paid every week. And he ran a tight ship. If you didn't show up for your shift, he would get on the phone and get on them. And they balked at working holidays too. And so it was it was funny because they don't have traditional employee benefits with retirement or sick days. So they, you know, have to find replacements. And it was what I found is anytime something went out of the norm, that's when it spawned a lot of great discussion that showed the structure of the whole organization. Now, this is truly a criminal enterprise. Oh, it was. It really was. Because when you looked at the roles that each person had, you had the lookout, you had the armed people, you had the communications people who were making sure that the lock had enough cocaine for sale each day. Then you had the manager who the problems went to, the paymaster. And so the couple, Frank, Frank Lopez and Evelyn Torres, they just, they kept that cocaine and the records, but they weren't the paymaster. That was Pino, one of the other guys, and his only job was to get all that cash on Sundays when the lunch truck comes. On July 3rd of 1998, the manager of the whole block got arrested by Philadelphia police with a gun in his vehicle. We got word right away, and we adopted that case federally because this guy was going to be indicted in the drug case. And so we brought him in and told him that we're going to take over this gun case, but you also have a big drug case that's coming down the pipe. And he agreed to cooperate and was allowed a thorough debriefing with a proffer so that anything he said to us couldn't be used against him, that letter of protection, that he could tell us everything. And the one thing he confirmed for us was, where the records were kept in that house on 8th Street with Frank Lopez and Evelyn Torres and how that worked. So based on that information, I got a search warrant. Barbara Cohan was the U.S. attorney on this, and she was a true partner all the way through on this investigation. And we got a search warrant for Frank and Evelyn's house on July 3rd of 1998. We served it, and we recovered the pay records, but they would delete their page every week after it was over. But we found the current one that was in operation and indented writing behind it of previous weeks' worth of uh, writing that they had done in the analysis of their notebook. Once the search took place, they knew they were under investigation. And, and that's really when you, the FBI tips their hand, when the search takes place of evidence that you've obtained through your wiretap and witness interviews and surveillance. It, it all comes together with the culmination of seizing the evidence with a search warrant. And at that time, it disrupted what was going on because they all knew we were looking at them. One of the defendants was sent to Frank and Evelyn and make the offer, Maurice wants to give you a paid vacation in Puerto Rico because he was worried that they were going to cooperate since we caught them red-handed with the drug evidence as well as the records. And at this point, they really don't know how much we have, but they know we've got them, and it's a solid case. So Maurice tried to get them to uh, move to Puerto Rico. He would pay for it, but they didn't want to go, and they were not cooperating, but they did not want to leave town, but they ultimately did move to another house out of 8th Street. Were they in fear of their lives, though? Did he ever threaten them? Well, that was to come. So at this point, he's just asked them to move, but they knew why, and they told him they're not, they're not cooperating, but he didn't believe them. So they decided it would be prudent if they moved out of the neighborhood and got out of this altogether. In my interview with the manager, with the proffer, one thing the wiretap showed, I had about 50 calls that were unrelated to the drug organization, but it involved Maurice Lewis's brother, Anthony. Anthony was clearly a burglar that was stealing stuff, and he had a fence, a guy that was buying the stuff named Chuck. So I had all these calls from Chuck and Anthony, about 50 of them. And one of the very first calls that came in 
about them. Anthony tells Chuck, the police came in the front door, and I, I had to run out the back door so I didn't get caught, and I stepped on a nail. And and then kind of asked, I can't go back in until nighttime, and what do you want kind of a conversation. So I knew that Chuck knew everything that he bought from Anthony was stolen after he told him that story. And that was one of the earliest calls I intercepted between the two of them. So when I am doing the interview with the manager, I said, tell me about Anthony and Chuck. What's the story with them? And he looks at me and says, oh, Anthony steals fireplaces. I said, what? Who steals fireplaces? He goes, Anthony. And he said, these are the old antique ones that are nicely carved. So I go back and I review my video and I see them loading fireplaces onto Chuck's truck on the block. And I have a couple of times. And so it was clear to me that these thefts were with iron gate, any antique architecture type of stuff that they would talk about. So this guy Chuck had a truck. He would load it up over at Anthony's house. And um, it took me a while before I got all of those conversations transcribed. And once I did, I went to a task force police officer and I said, can you identify any of these burglaries with any of these conversations, the dates, the times, and see what we might have? And I said, here's Chuck and here's Anthony. And they're clearly in business together. And I also pulled all of Chuck's telephone records to take a look at them and see who the subscriber was to that number. And it was clear that he lived in New Jersey or he had a New Jersey number. So all of my calls from Chuck to uh, Anthony was interstate. It went from New Jersey to Philadelphia, and there were huge volumes of calls to about six or seven people in Philadelphia that really stuck out when I looked at like 60 calls to a row house in Philadelphia. So it wasn't just Anthony. I was able to, with a phone analysis, identify each house that had this tremendous volume of calls to. I ran records to see, has anyone there ever been arrested? And found a burglar with charges pending living at every house. So there was a, I don't know, about four or five of them. So a lot of them had charges pending. I eventually identified Chuck's name. And at the conclusion of the wiretap on the drug case, one thing that happens is intercept notifications are given to anyone who gets intercepted in a wiretap. You're given a letter that your conversations were intercepted by the FBI. I've gotten one because... I had to talk to somebody in the case or whatever. But, uh, yeah, if you were intercepted on a wiretap, you would know it eventually because you would get an intercept notice, and they go out by mail. Those are the same things as the overhears. Yes, it's an overhear notice, notification. And so I, as the investigator, like to can deliver the ones to people that I want to talk to and interview. <laughs> so, okay. Yours will not come in the mail. I will hand deliver them. So I had Chuck's address in Medford, New Jersey. And so I went to the house to find him. And it was a beautiful old brick farmhouse. And Chuck, it turns out, had sold the house to somebody else who told me that, oh, he moved to North Carolina. I said, oh, I said, was he an antique dealer that you knew of? He goes, yeah, the barn out back here was loaded with antiques when I was looking at the house to buy it. And he said, in fact, I saw him loading it all up uh, to take the stuff out. And uh, so he said, I think he's opened an antique business down in North Carolina. And he said, uh, I can give you the closing attorney who would have his current address. He said, by the way, you know the history of this house. I said, no, I don't. He said, well, this house was originally on the Underground Railroad. In the living room, there's a trap door that goes out underground and comes up in the barn. But it was used in the 1970s as a private sex club. 
and they had converted the house with shag rugs and mirrors, and whenever the police came, everybody went down the tunnel and out to the barn. <laughs> I was like, really? I never heard of this. And he said, oh, it's been in the newspapers and everything back then. So as the current owner of the house, he had the history of the house. And so I then do further investigation on Chuck and identified him as Charles Cass. And it turns out he was a, a former IRS agent and Department of Labor agent that worked in my building. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I must. I said I'd recognize him because I worked in the building for over 25 years. And you see people routinely in the elevator from the cafeteria or whatever. So I was shocked to learn that the fence was a federal agent. I had actually met him a couple of times working on a, a fraud case that had to do with um, overpaying or underpaying labor employees. That was his specialty. He spent 13 years with the IRS and another 13 with the Department of Labor and actually had a desk in the U.S. Attorney's Office. And he had some pretty high-profile cases with the Labor Department. One in particular was with the Philadelphia Police Department health benefits or something. And when I was trying to get a photo of Chuck, the U.S. Attorney's Office had one of him getting an award from Janet Reno. And I was like... That's the only, I gotta find another photo. I can't put that in a photo spread. <laughs> so, wow. I have, yeah, I was, I was shocked. So, I ultimately was able to get a North Carolina driver's license photo. And then I had to find bearded, bald, with glasses, uh, white males to make a good photo spread to have witnesses identify him for me. And that was a challenge to make them as look-alike, middle-aged, you know, white males with beards and glasses. So ultimately I did, and uh, I would um, show this photo spread to anybody I interviewed on this case. And at this point, my supervisor allowed me to work it, and got we got an IRS agent, Pete Brustis, assigned, as well as a top staff agent. So the three of us worked this case together. Explain that a little because what would typically be done if you're working a drug case and you come up with this fraud or property crime case, what typically would happen? Typically it would be reassigned to somebody else on the squad that handles that violation. But because this was so involved with the drug case, and it, it became sort of a special circumstance when you have a federal agent as your subject. They allowed the three of us to work the case as a team. So because he was a former IRS agent, I brought him on board, and um, and Steve Haney came in from the property crime squad, and the three of us worked it. And we brought in a financial analyst to analyze his finances, see how much money he was earning from all of this on top of his salary because he was doing this while employed as an agent. By the time I got him identified, he had retired and opened an antique store in North Carolina. But the criminal behavior was taking place while he was employed, and he parked his truck right outside the U.S. Attorney's office, and he would meet the thieves right by an ATM machine outside the U.S. Attorney's office. At, at the time, Raman Haas was the building where the ATM machine was, and they, a lot of the thieves ended up thinking he was a chemist or something like that. They, they did not know he was law enforcement at all. Oh, this is the ATM that's right across from the Liberty Bell. Yes. Wow. Yes. How, how ironic. <laughs> yes. And he would have his truck loaded with antiques parked right in that Street there. So eventually, the police officer I gave the 50 conversations to got back to me and said, you aren't going to believe this, but this is the guy who returned St. Peter's church gates to the police department. The theft of St. Peter's church gates at 3rd and Pine, and there's seven 
at least seven to ten feet tall iron gate valued at about ten thousand dollars from the 1700s was all over the news at the time that they were stolen. It turns out that he, Chuck was still employed when he returned them and gave a statement to the police because of the publicity of these gates being stolen. And Chuck's statement to the police was that he saw a guy with a truck with the gates on the back, stopped and said, I buy antiques, will you sell them to me? And he'd never seen the guy before and couldn't identify him if he ever saw him again and had no information on the guy that he bought them from, didn't know they were stolen, found out they were, and then returned them after it was in the news. That was what he said, but that was not true. My investigation showed that the guy that he bought them from is somebody he had been in frequent contact and had bought numerous stolen items from over a long period of time, and he would pay him the cash at the ATM machine. And uh, at this point, I, the Internet was not really available to us yet, so I went to my public library, pulled up the newspaper articles about the church gate theft, then I compared Chuck's phone records, and I thought, all right, if the theft took place on this date, when's the next long-distance call he made? Because I figured he's got to get rid of these gates quickly. And there was a number to Maryland. I cold-called it. And Fritz Durbeck answered the phone, and I said, I identified myself, and I said, are you an antique store by any chance? He said, yes, I am. I said, did you by any chance buy some church gates from Chuck Cast? He goes, yes, I did. And I found out they were stolen. And I called him up and told him, you got to take these back. He said that he actually had driven up to Philadelphia to take a look at the remaining pair of gates to see if they matched the pair he had in his possession. And then he called Chuck and told him, if you throw them in the river or something, I'm turning you in. So Chuck was between a rock and a hard place at that point because if he didn't turn them in, this uh, uh, antique dealer who bought them from him would turn him in. So Chuck went back down, and Chuck told him he was an FBI agent. Oh, retired, yeah. that's not good. He no. said he was a retired FBI agent and that everything was good with this. That's how he had told, uh, identified himself to the antique dealer. So Chuck returned the gate. And the antique dealer had all his paperwork, a receipt from when he purchased them, and then when Chuck put them back, and he had Chuck sign them. For me, this was like panning for gold. I mean, this was a cold call, and I said, well, all your paperwork, I'll have a subpoena, and I'll come down and uh, get all your documents. And so then I went down and did the interview and um, got a copy of all the uh, paperwork that went with the church gate. And... Now I have his Chuck statement to the police where he doesn't say that he sold it and bought it back. None of that's in there. And also I interviewed the thief who actually stole it who said that, oh, yeah, I sell them stuff all the time. They all got paid like $200, $300 for whatever their stuff was. It was always cash and it was always near an ATM machine. So ultimately... We uh, showed over $300,000 of money going through that account. Then we started looking at all the withdrawals and where the ATM machines were that the withdrawals took place. The financial analyst did a great job. We had uh, yeah, almost 400000 It was $393 went through the account. And at that one ATM machine, it was over 111000 in a 15-month period. And this has been going on for a long time. And this was just the money he took out to pay for mm-hmm. items, the stolen items. We don't even yes. know yet how much he made off of these items. Yes. So he paid $600 for the gates when they were stolen and sold them for 1100 down in uh, Maryland at the antique store. And uh, the gates were valued at over... It really... They, it said 10000 but honestly, something from the 1700s, you almost can't put a value on that, you know? So the church fortunately had a really wonderful drawing of the antique, the architectural rendering of the gates that was drawn up by the surveyor or whoever drew it before they were made. 
and we were able to get that paperwork and then actually go down and photograph the gates on the church. And so when when this came to light to the U.S. Attorney's Office, a lot of the attorneys had worked with this man on cases. They ended up assigning it to Linda Dale Hoffa, who was a senior litigator and had never had a case with him and did not know him. She and I walked down to the church from her office to go look at the gate and see what our case was about. And in the federal system, to show theft of interstate property, there has to be a value of over $5,000 worth of merchandise that went across state lines. I was very cognizant of that $5,000 threshold. And so as I identified each thief, I learned more and more about how they operated. These guys were stealing the iron gates off people's front porch, front porch, their yard, and they were selling them wholesale at auction houses in New Jersey and Maryland. And they would go with a truckload, lay it out, whatever it brought. So they all had, there were records of all these people selling their stuff there. So I went to the auction houses and interviewed the auctioneers and got the records of each theft, uh, each thief, all of the uh, gates and fireplaces and all of those things that they were selling and basically robbing the city of their uh, historical heritage as far as architecture went. They would steal anything. Corbells. I, I learned a whole other language in this investigation of things that, uh, antique things that I didn't know about. The Corbell in particular, which is sort of an art joint uh, decorative piece if you look it up stained glass windows. So they would go into any house that was maybe for sale. There was one particular house I felt so bad because the people bought it because of all of its lovely old antique stained glass windows and everything. And between the time of their settlement and moving in, somebody from this group stripped it all out and uh, sold wow. it. Wow. Yeah. And the auctioneers who purchased these items, where did they think they were coming from? They don't, they just sell it. They don't purchase it. So the buyers come up from all over and they end up making repurposed furniture. Like the iron gate would have a glass tabletop on top of it or it would hang on a wall. Restaurants uh, have antiques all over. They get sold ultimately to that kind of a people. Antique dealers are who come and purchase from the auctions. The auction house function is really just to sell it. It comes there. They don't really, they don't have praising it or anything. They just auction it off. But the antique dealers are who come and purchase all this stuff for pennies on the dollar. And then they sell it in their antique stores or they make other things out of them. But there's never any attempt to see if this stuff is stolen for the most part. It just so happened with the church gates. There was a lot of publicity and when Mr. Sturbeck went to resell it, and he looked, found it on the Internet and thought, well, I can't sell this. These things are stolen. And that's when he made his phone call to Chuck. So in the meantime, I'm interviewing, Linda uh, Hoffa and I are interviewing all the thieves. So I would go to every court hearing for one of the burglars and present them with a grand jury uh, subpoena. And we would bring them in and talk to them before they went to the grand jury. And they all told us truthfully, what Chuck and, it wasn't just Chuck and Anthony, there were a handful of guys that he was buying from. So in the meantime, I'm going to the auction houses, uh, getting all those records, interviewing all the thieves, and uh, at some point, there's apparently a very big antique fair or gathering in Atlanta every year. One of the thieves I interviewed ran into Chuck down there and told him, hey, if I were you, I would never go back to Philadelphia again. The FBI is asking questions about you. That wow. was how he found out. So before that, he had no idea that he was being investigated. No. no. So I had uh, agents in North Carolina had identified two antique stores he was running, and I sent them in to ask him if he had something that I knew he did not have to see if he would still reach out to one of the thieves up here to get it. 
And um, But that didn't pan out. But I at least had him identified and knew what he was doing down there. Uh, Chuck reached out to an attorney that he had worked with before on one of his Department of Labor cases and had him call the U.S. Attorney's Office to ask if he was under investigation. And so at that point, he said he was willing to come in and proffer. The investigation was pretty much done at this point. We had all the finances assembled and the tapes. We had video him on videotape taking the fireplaces and all that stuff, as well as all the audio tape. And uh, then all the thieves were lined up to say, yeah, I sold him a lot of stuff. He came in and we sat and it was honestly one of the most difficult interviews because uh, he didn't come in and easily talk about it. But ultimately, he did confess to what he was doing. But it was it was not an easy interview. So was he trying to mitigate or deny his participation at first? Uh, yeah, he tried to say he didn't know the stuff was stolen and he just loved antiques and stuff like that. But then his reaction was so strange when he finally owned up to it. We were like, well, this isn't going anywhere if you don't admit what you did. And finally he did, but it was very difficult for him to do. And his comment I thought was really strange. He goes, you don't understand. I can't go to another Strike Force Christmas party again. Show my face. That's the least of your worries. I'm like, really? He's, he's wor- yeah, he's worried about his reputation <laughs> with the Strike Force and the U.S. attorneys that he's worked with in the past. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Which I thought really odd. I mean, this is a serious problem here. (laughs) He agreed to plead guilty. So he pled guilty November 15th of 2000. He was sentenced in March, March 9th of 2001, and had to appear before Chief Judge James Giles, who is a judge that Chuck had had cases before. Oh, my God. Uh, when he was an agent. And Giles remembered him? Oh, yes. Yes, he did. And he sentenced him to 18 months and made him go to jail that day of sentencing. And I think he was shocked when that happened. Because a lot of times people report later. He was fined $36,000 and led to jail that day. Awkward. Yes. Yes. <laughs> And it was, I did recognize him when I finally saw the picture of him with Janet Reno. I thought, I've been in the elevator with him, but I'd never had a case with him or anything like that. Wow. You have given me a a copy of the drawing of the St. Peter's Gate. And so I will make sure that I scan that and put that in the show notes for anybody who wants to take a look at the drawing. And then I also have a newspaper article that has uh, an actual photo of the gate. And so uh, that will be available if anybody wants to go to my website, jerrywilliams.com, and actually take a look at the type of things that uh, he was stealing and uh, are having stolen for him uh, so that he could resell them. I really love that drawing of the church gate. And as you know, I'm a quilter, and so I took my big grand jury exhibit and I actually stitched the entire architecture drawing as a quilt for myself personally. About two years ago, I was giving a presentation with a a friend, Kitty Caparella, who was a former reporter and on quilts to women at the YMCA in Philadelphia. And every quilt tells a story. And when I told the story of this quilt, the women in the audience said, my church gate was stolen. And another one said, so was mine, and I couldn't afford to re- replace it. I said, well, you're happy to know he did get caught. <laughs> well, can we see a picture of your quilt, too? Uh, yeah, I'll take one for you. Okay, great, great. Yeah, I just did a pencil drawing and then stitched it. But uh, it, it's very detailed with the uh, drawing of this gate. It was, I thought it was a pretty gate. Oh, yeah, it is. I'm looking at it now. It is. And and that's something that we did talk about 
and the first interview that uh, you and I did together. And, you know, it still is, you know, really interesting that here you are, a seasoned veteran drug investigator, you know, knocking down doors and, and arresting drug dealers. And then when you go home, you're making beautiful quilts. It's very relaxing. So I want to go back to the drug case and finish that up now and tell you what happened with that. Yeah. Frequently, drug cases spawn other investigations. A lot of times it's public corruption type investigations. This one was an anomaly with the theft of the antique architecture. So the drug case, I left off after we did the search, and uh, the couple was threatened at that point or asked to go move to Puerto Rico, and they refused, but they moved out of the neighborhood. So when they didn't accept his free trip to Puerto Rico, Ubi, Ubaldo LeBron, went to visit Maurice. Maurice was in jail pending the, the indictment. Ubi went to visit him, and Frank, he told him he wanted him to get rid of Frank and Evelyn, which he understood to mean to have them killed. So Ubi and Trevis Pinkett, threw a hand grenade through the window of their house. They, what they didn't realize is there was a secondary pin of safety that saved their life. They pulled the big pin, but not a secondary one. And it was an Army military hand grenade that they had gotten their hands on and threw it through the window of their house, and uh, it landed on a where they gas heating grate was right on the floor in the living room. It would have damaged probably not just their house. So Frank and Evelyn still were not cooperating when this happened. When all of the arrests took place of the 19 individuals, I remember one of the guys said, you can't arrest me for this. I did this two years ago. I guess he (laughs) thought if he didn't get caught red-handed, it didn't count. (laughs) Oh, God. (laughs) Thanks for that confession. Yeah. Way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ultimately, all the defendants proffered. So I had all 18 guys besides Maurice give truthful statements about their involvement and be willing to testify against Maurice. What about honor uh, among thieves? Well, the last holdout really was the guy who did the grenade because he was so loyal to Maurice. He, he really was a father figure to him. And uh, it came down to you have to give it all up or you don't get any benefit whatsoever. You can't pick and choose and say, I'll only tell you this much. And we knew that Maurice had ordered the hit on Frank and Evelyn, but we needed him to say it. And eventually he took a polygraph, he failed, and he then admitted the truth and said yes and told about the visit to the prison where Maurice told him to get rid of them. So... All of the defendants pled guilty, and when it came time for Maurice's sentencing, which he pled guilty to the drug conspiracy, and he was facing a life term, we had them testify as to the throwing the hand grenade through the window because Maurice had already beat a death penalty case on another murder, I think in 2000. And so he was pretty confident that he could beat anything after having gone through that. And that was before our case, our indictment took place. The cocaine organization averaged forty to sixty thousand dollars of income per day. And as I remember at the sentencing when Maurice was sentenced to life in prison and he had to forfeit over a million dollars in assets, neighbors came to the courtroom and said They thanked us. They said uh, that their neighborhood had been in the grip of that for over 10 years, and it was a world of difference in their quality of life when the drug dealing stopped on their block. And we actually had an intercept of a conversation that was played at his sentencing where Maurice threatened to go down and beat a woman who did not and make her move because she didn't want drug dealing going on on the block. Wow. There was a conversation, I recall, he called a restaurant. He liked to take all the guys out for a meal. So he'd have a huge party. And he, the waitress 
the uh, hostess said, would you like smoking or non-smoking? He goes, do you have a crack smoking section? I mean, he was very open about it. She said, excuse me? Wow. Now, of course, we need to know what happened to the older couple. So they pled guilty and were sentenced. I believe Evelyn got probation, and I'm not sure that Frank spent very much time in jail either. They uh, were able to go on with their lives after they cooperated and testified. They took full responsibility of everything they did. And I don't recall what time Frank got, but I think Evelyn got probation. I think Frank had to do some time. I take it that the grenade through their front window had a lot to do uh, as as an incentive for them to finally cooperate. Yes. In fact, the police responded. You know, they called when the grenade was thrown through the window, and the police interviewed him. Do you have any idea why this would have happened? And he said, I think it was the FBI. They want me to cooperate. <laughs> like, well, we don't go to those extremes. <laughs> you know, but as they were very grateful at the end that we stayed with this all the way to the end and found out what really happened. And no, we do not go to those lengths to get people to cooperate with us. <laughs> yeah, that's but strange. I thought, yeah. I thought that was funny that he told the police that. When it was quite obvious that it was uh, the other way around, that uh, right. Maurice's group were the ones okay. uh, who did not want him to cooperate. Well, he knew that. He was afraid of him. You know, he tried to get him to move to Puerto Rico, and I guess that's how Maurice dealt with other threats to his security. But he did not know during this time that all of the other defendants had lined up. And I'll never forget riding in the car with Barb from our very last interview. I looked over at her and I said, you know how he sells his bitches, the kilos of cocaine? I said, well, Maurice is down to his last two bitches, and it's you and me. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh, great, great. That's a fascinating case. It really is. Um, and it's uh, it's about really just picking up the phone and being on the wrong phone call at the wrong time when it comes to uh, Chuck Cass. It was. One of the reporters called it serendipity, a happy accident. And he would have gotten away with it had it not been for the drug case. And we touched on it before when on our first interview, and uh, I just uh, would love to hear, you know, what you had to say about working this type of, these type of uh, drug and narcotics investigations for most of your career. What are your thoughts about that? These investigations, to me, are like putting a puzzle piece together, and everywhere you look, it's like adding a new piece to your puzzle until you have the complete picture. And in this particular case, was probably one of my favorite because it was a diversion and it was it just seemed like everywhere I went I was getting a new puzzle piece and that's the end of the interview back at jerrywilliams.com you'll find a photo of Judy newspaper links to articles about the Maurice Lewis criminal enterprise and the Charles Cass investigation There's also a sketch of St. Peter's Gates and a photo of the quilt that Judy made. I hope you enjoyed the episode and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. At the bottom of the show notes, you'll find all the social media share buttons. And of course, if you're listening to this on a podcast app, you can share it directly from your device. Now, this is the part of the podcast episode for you crime fiction lovers. As you know, I try to read two or three books a month, but I don't always recommend to you the books that I read. I don't have one for this episode, but only because I have taken on the challenge to read Natchez Burning by Greg Isles. I have to admit, when I decided to read the novel, I had no idea that it was 865 pages. I'm cheating a little by reading and also listening to the audiobook. Natchez Burning is a dramatic and emotional story about black and white families in Natchez, Mississippi in the 1960s. It's a tale about hatred, racism, the Ku Klux Klan, 
and murder. I can tell you already, I will be recommending this book to you, but I think I should wait until I get to the end to do that officially. In the meantime, if you're looking for a good crime thriller to read, you can always pick up my FBI crime thriller, Pay to Play, about a female FBI agent investigating corruption in the Philadelphia strip club industry. It's available at Amazon.com as an ebook, trade paperback, and audiobook. This episode was sponsored by FBIRetired.com, the only online directory made available to the general public featuring retired FBI agents and analysts interested in showcasing their skills to secure business opportunities. I want to thank you for listening, and I hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.